I don't know where any of the other timings, template rendering, but I have that. Uh... Um, Spectre, if you want to go ahead and fire up the uh, recording. <clears throat> Looks like it's already recording. Oh, how about that? Uh, okay. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. This is Shane Gibson with Rackend here for version 23 on Tuesday, August 14th of the Digital Rebar Meetup. Uh, got a light crowd today from the Rackend side. We got Victor Lowther on board with us, and Stephen Spector, and myself. Uh, the rest of the team are winging their way across the country to various important and exciting things. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, some interesting enhancements to the portal uh, and the UI to help with determining uh, performance of workflows. So there's the ability now to look, see tasks that are rendered and run on machines, the timings, the workflow timings of those tasks. So you can get a good idea of what tasks in your workflow are taking the longest amount of time. Uh, this came up because we had a lot of uh, uh, connections and integrations with external infrastructure, and a lot of times a workflow would take 30 minutes or something, and, and someone would say, hey, um, I don't understand why this is taking so long, and we'd be like, okay, well, calling out to your Active Directory instance to register the machine into AD has failed and failed and failed and failed, and it's retrying, retrying. So that uh, gives us the ability to sort of allow you to introspect into your workflows, what's going on there. We'll show that as well as um, one of the perennial problems when you're creating content is uh, how does that content get rendered to a machine in its final form so you know uh, how it's being run. Since we inject parameters, profiles, you can iterate over uh, complex uh, JSON arrays, et cetera, and inject all of those things into scripts or configuration files. Sometimes things don't go right the way you expected, and you want to see how that template was rendered, which will help give you clues on how things broke so you can fix them uh, and also understand exactly what was served to a machine. Uh, we now expose that that data has always been available through the jobs logs on the system, but they weren't uh, easily accessible through uh, tooling. So the UX now exposes those and shows those. There were some various other Easter eggs that Rob has dropped into the UX, which I'm going to have to try and remember to find. Most of them all relate to uh, Kubernetes, crib cluster stuff, and some helpful patterns around those. Uh, Victor's going to talk to us about a couple things today. He's uh, worked on getting Mac OS uh, BSDP protocol support for NetBoot Net install of Mac OS on Mac hardware, and that has been completed into um, basically what we'd loosely call a minimal viable product. It's functioning and working. Uh, we're waiting to get some feedback from some cu customers on that and maybe some improvements going forward in that. Uh, he's going to talk to us a little bit about what's involved with that and how that works. Uh, he's also going to talk to us about auditing. Uh, there were some enhancements added into the auditing and RBAC system, uh, which is in the core of digital rebar provision that allows us to get enhancements on triggered events and who caused them. So he'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, if I can get my classify uh, engine test demo working in the background while we're going over all the other cool stuff, um, I will show you a demo of how to classify, uh, use the classify content to drive a machine automatically through a workflow uh, so you could essentially boot a machine up, it would classify itself and do something based on the classification of the machine and drive it through another given workflow. Uh, as always, we'll follow up with community uh, open forum to, for questions and discussions, etc. So that's the agenda for today. Uh, let's, um, I'll go ahead and kick off right now with the uh, portal enhancements. So. One of the first portal enhancements uh, that's really interesting, it's really nice for uh, trying to 
nail down uh, in high uh, um, large infrastructure where you're doing lots and lots of machine provisioning activity, you want to optimize things, make fa things faster, you need to introspect and determine what's going on and how long things are taking in the first place before you can iterate on making them faster. So the UX now provides a, an analysis of the jobs run or the tasks run uh, on a given machine and gives you some feedback on that. So normally if you take a machine, um, I stole somebody's DRP endpoint here. I think this is probably Rob's endpoint so we won't make any changes on it. But he ran these machines through this CribFast cluster uh, workflow. And if we click on the workflow, we can see that it has our standard uh, workflow pieces uh, in here where we go through Kubernetes install, etcd config, crib config, crib helm, crib live wait. So there's a couple of stages that this uh, workflow drives through. But after you've driven a machine through uh, this, these stages, through this workflow, we now see this new panel on the workflow. So you, to find that, if you were uh, just searching around for that, as opposed to clicking on it from the bulk actions, you would go to workflows. You would find, in this case, CribFast cluster, and it shows you the CribFast fast cluster workflow here. And then you can see, theoretically, a machine driven through it. Uh, apparently, we've got a little issue there. So I think maybe driving straight to it from the machine. Yeah, so I think it's, we're not getting the, the machine UUIDs in that list correctly. But so for now, go to the bulk actions and we can actually see the list of the timing. So in this case, we actually had a, a crib config fail, which took a long time since crib has a, a timeout before it eventually will do a final fail. But if we take a look at um, good run here, so Rob has been iterating over some of the content here and, and developing content, making changes, hence a lot of the failures. Uh, but in this case, if we take a look at one of the failures, we can see things like Kubernetes install took around 19 seconds. Uh, etcd config took also around 19 seconds uh, and for the stage overall and the actual etcd config task total was 24. As you can see, we get all of these timings. Uh, crib config was the biggest piece. So crib config took 145 seconds, which is doing a lot of uh, individual um, complex sort of m cluster master uh, with a kube atom pattern and writing params back. So there's a lot happening in there. And we can see that this is actually the significant bulk of uh, the, the time spent in this workflow. So we might want to look at that closer and see what's happening in that and do some timing in our crib config to see if there was something we could do better. Some things are just going to take a while. And in this case, we can see what's taking a while. And this can help answer the question of why is my workflow taking so long? All right, so that's sort of the first interesting thing. The other uh, interesting thing, I'm going to switch over uh, to another machine here. Um, rendering, uh, when you're doing content, conf uh, uh, let me actually show content. So just in case to help uh, couch this. So in, in content, we often use uh, a lot of parameters. So a parameter might be setting a DNS domain. We have a string value here. The parameter name is DNS domain. And you would render this uh, in a, a template, uh, ultimately, that does something and uses uh, all of these parameters in this information to create uh, dynamic uh, content. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm not sure what a good one is off the top of my head here, but that's yeah, not a good one. Um, so here's an example of the uh, bin bash uh, calling an external template. So, and then we're filling in a machine UID. Now this is pretty simple stuff here, but as you get more complex workflows, you get different templatized, uh, Golang templatized pieces embedded in your templates and trying to understand how that looks when it gets rendered to a given machine is often the problem. And you often will get uh, side effects if you render things incorrectly. Um, and sometimes you, if you're rendering, a, for example, YAML configuration files, YAML are space sensitive. There are some templating uh, uh, pieces, for example, dash, close brace, close brace, which will uh, trim white spaces on following lines which in YAML can cause problems. So if you accidentally did that, you might end up with an invalid YAML specification file and that will cause you grief. So you wanna see how that gets rendered. 
that gets rendered now uh, with each job log. So if you go to your job logs and you see we have a lot of job logs that are run here and I can take any one of these specifically and say, uh, let's say SSH access, what happened with SSH access? Uh, this is the actual job log most people are gonna be familiar with and we see that it finished the success, but then we wanna see what else was used with that job. So in this case, the template access keys that shell that template uh, was used. And if we render it, this is the rendered job itself. So we actually see now the bin bash shell template after Golang uh, templating has rendered it and passed it down to a machine. In this case, there's nothing particularly interesting in here because we don't have any SSH keys that were injected. But if they were, we would see all of these things happening uh, in this case. Uh, in this case, there's nothing. Is there a question there? Nope, okay. Yes, Chris is saying on uh, chat, oh, the rendering thing is nice. It's very nice. Um, it's something that's been driving me crazy for a long time and I realized we had this information and we just weren't making it accessible. Um, writing content is one of the hardest things to do with digital rebar provision to get it all tweaked and running right. Um, there was, uh, DRP CLI install. So here's an example of us installing our uh, runner agent on a machine, DRP CLI install. But you can see if we actually render the templates now, the templates uh, render out to a, a fair number of templates in this case. And so we have uh, our DRP CLI Etsy template uh, defines the endpoint the RS token and RS UUID that get written out to Etsy DRP CLI. Uh, the Etsy export template, similar, similar content that gets written out. We have our uh, unit file for uh, system, not system D, but um, the standard startup services, uh, various other unit files, system five unit files. Uh, we actually have uh, all of these things, you get to see each one of these as they're rendered, been rendered and served to the machine. And now you can get a detailed look at what has happened in there. So for an example on this, um, this is the DRP CLI uh, task. So it is task DRC PLI install. So if we take a look at that task, we can see that these are the templates that were rendered to the machine. And if we look at the first template, that first template that had the three uh, uh, bash uh, uh, variables that were being set, our RS endpoint, RS token, RS UUID, we see here is our actual template. So we actually see the Golang templatized piece that gets filled in and boom, now we can really start to uh, understand exactly what's happening there. Um, so it's very important when you're uh, getting into more advanced usage patterns and understanding uh, what's happening in your templating uh, when you're rendering those to the machine and uh, debugging those, um, super handy. It's been extremely helpful since we've uh, built that. Uh, it, it's uh, really nice. Uh, some of the other, uh, I, uh, let's see if we can find these real fast. I won't belabor this too much, but uh, in the crib cluster stuff, um, we have uh, a couple of things that were uh, added for Kubernetes for rendering. Um, I don't remember what they were. You remember off the top of your head, uh, Victor, what he was, what uh, Rob was saying this morning? For Kubernetes, no. Uh, let me see here. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Rendering machine creates for packet. Yeah, yeah, that, oh, that was a good one, yeah. Uh, reset in Kubernetes render, add metadata render. Uh, so yeah, um, there are some patterns for helping with Kubernetes, needless to say. <laughs> some of the, the patterns um, uh, have things like, we do have a keep, no, I don't see the render keep stuff. Uh, we'll leave that for another day. Rob will be excited to show it off. He's added, done a lot of work around it. It does, it makes uh, uh, managing, uh, especially a dev pattern when you're deploying content, uh, making changes to content. Uh, you need to reset your profiles uh, that in this case, crib writes information to profiles as part of the 
uh, process to record what's occurring on the machine. Uh, we can see those uh, in the individual profiles. Uh, so in this case, uh, if we look at the bulk actions, we would see uh, he has a profile named crib. And if we look at the crib cluster, all of these things that re get recorded, uh, you often want to uh, nuke all of these, but there's some of them you want to keep. So one of the patterns is um, uh, being able to nuke everything except a set of reset keeps. So this was one of the things he was talking about. Uh, so in this case, it, if we uh, nuke all of the profiles on this, it'll keep the crib cluster profile and etcd cluster profile. And you can set these uh, additionally in, in your uh, profiles as metadata, and then the dev reset uh, workflow that cleans all of this up will uh, react accordingly. So if you're setting an HA cluster, you want to keep things like the uh, cluster master VIP, uh, which is necessary for HA. Uh, you'll need to keep things like etcd servers. Uh, if you want to specify the specific servers uh, to be plumbed up, uh, the crib cluster uh, masters as well uh, is the list of masters for the machine. So if you wanted to ensure these survived the dev reset cleanup, uh, this is where things like reset keeps metadata comes in play. Uh, also in Kubernetes clusters, we uh, see the render crib part. So the render crib part uh, allows us to drop into the UX the ability to um, grab the uh, built admin.com file so we can do kubectl commands against the uh, cluster. Uh, it just makes it much easier to operate the cluster. Uh, and we see that uh, that's actually in the cluster admin comp. So this is the actual cluster admin configuration and credentials that allow you to uh, use kubectl against the cluster and authenticate against the cluster and, and operate against it. So these patterns just make it much easier and more accessible. Uh, the other pattern that is interesting is, um, I will not do it here because I don't know what API's keys he has plugged in place there. Um, I will go to, here we go. Um, I need to bring up my endpoint. Uh, what we're going to talk about next is the um, plugins have the ability to take actions. Uh, in this case, uh, Packet IPMI plugin uh, allow, now allows us to create and instantiate machines on uh, Packet infrastructure. If my endpoint, uh, well, let's go ahead and just do it here. I will clean it up. Um, so on this machine, if we go to the plugin, and we have the packet IPMI plugin set here. Uh, we now see we have a plugin create machine. So we're going to do machine test. Uh, we're going to count one and bare metal type and say boom. We've now issued the command that quickly to create a machine in uh, packet portal. Uh, in this case, it'll also it just return the machine that was created. So machine test zero uh, was created for us. Uh, I believe that's probably because uh, I'm not sure why. I, I guess our we append zero uh, numerics on the end of the uh, plugin there. But in that, this case, we actually created the machine, fired it up, uh, and launched it and brought it into Digital Rebar Provision. So that's pretty cool. Um, the VirtualBox IPMI and the Packet IPMI plugin providers have this ability now also. All right, um, that's going to turn, we're going to turn the mic over to Victor for a little bit and let him talk. Uh, uh, we'll let him choose whether he wants to do Mac OS stuff uh, and talk freeform about that or wants to do auditing. And I believe he has a little bit of a demo on the auditing, logging, and event stuff. Uh, so, Victor, the show is all yours. I will stop sharing and let you grab sharing now. All right, so let me share my second desktop. Okay, so first thing that's going to show off is we have shiny new um, principle, or what I'm choosing to call principle tracking uh, as part of emitting uh, logs and events. Um, the very summarized version is that uh, any time an, an event is emitted or a uh, log entry is recorded, um, the events in the logs record uh, who or what was responsible for creating them. And so let me just uh, 
fire up. Uh, can you all see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay. The, uh, WebSocket. Um, yep. Shell and WebSocket. Yep. And so I'm running uh, Derp CLI in just a mode that lets me watch all the events that the system is generating as they stream through. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn on one of my uh, VMs. And we'll be able to watch it as it comes up. And you can see that uh, first thing it did was grab some leases and we saw that the, uh, the system that emitted that was the DHCP subsystem. Switch over to my logs and I've uh, gone ahead and I have a, uh, I'm watching the logs as they come through as well. And you can see that uh, the only log entry that has generated so far is a line that says, hey, we found uh, where 127.0.0.1 does and it came from Cacher. All right, so this guy should be booting up and we should see a machine. Check in here and we'll be able to see that it came from, we will be able to see that it came from the machine itself. It'll have that listed as the principal. Oh, and there just a bunch of stuff flew by. All right, so yeah, so we can see that there's uh, the runner for the machine UID was responsible for emitting this event that I can't really see because it includes all of the information about the thing. But we should also see a few additional um, entries where we can see that the runner um, generated some log entries and see that the runner generated them and just let me do something in the UX that would generate a log entry. So just refresh it here and we'll be able to see an entry. Okay. It's not showing me that. Curses. Let's see. Well, let's just do something else then. So let me just go ahead and force an entry here. And I'm apparently not logging at a level that actually shows that. Ah. Alas, so you can't see anything coming from Rocket Skates because I uh, have everything too pre-cached. But you can see that um, all the law, all the in, all the all the events that are being emitted, we can see where they're coming from. And for log entries that are created, we can see what was responsible for creating them. And there we go. I just had to completely refresh my browser. You can see that the uh, user rocket skates authenticated. And let me do something that'll generate a spiffy little effect. default info. Say, let's go to boot environments. And let's me find something to kill here. And let's delete that. Oh, and we can see that uh, the Rockets case user deleted one of our boot environments. And that got emitted as an event. So this works for all API interactions and really anything that interacts with uh, your provision at all. So you now have a level of audibility where you can track exactly who did what when by watching the event streams and the logs. 
And that's it for the eventing stuff. Uh, the other interesting thing that I've done over the past few weeks was added support for being able to boot uh, Macintosh systems over the network um, using their custom uh, boot service and discovery protocol. And so now if you happen to own a vast fleet of Macs and you want to install them all using something besides the official Mac OS server tools, we can do that. And that's pretty much for the, that's pretty much it for the demos that I had today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any questions so far? Hey, there we go. Chats. So uh, ultimately, though, um, yeah. So Chris is just saying, nice to have some more audit and event monitoring going on in there, and it definitely helps. And uh, incidentally, that. Um, he made a comment also that ties in with uh, the template rendering, uh, which can also help with audit uh, tracing. So you can now generate an exact as-built set of audit logs uh, based on the templates that were run uh, on a machine, and, and then you can point back to those if you're capturing those in some of your auditing uh, infrastructure and say, that X machine was driven through these workflows and these were the templates that were rendered. These were how they were rendered to the machine when it was run. So that's a, a very interesting uh, um, capability to be able to extend for auditing, which also ties in with uh, the general audit logging stuff that Victor was just showing us, uh, adding uh, the ability to add a little bit more detail and granularity to the audit information uh, that's coming off the system. Yep. Um, and so excellent, we thank you. The other thing that I'm currently working on, but don't have any in anywhere near a demoable state, is support for more than just the good old fashioned AMD 64 architecture. Um, I'm working on adding support for ARM 64, ARM 32, and whatever the new hotness and server CPU architectures is going to be in the next 10 years. Maybe Risk Five, maybe something else. So, cool, very exciting. Um, Last, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about classification. Um, one of the problems a lot of uh, organizations run into is uh, when they have a lot of infrastructure, uh, for example, they're bringing up uh, hundreds of machines, and some of those machines have differences, and they're going to become different roles in life. And to be able to handle that in an in infrastructure as a code sort of concept or tenant is to be able to classify that machine automatically and do something with that classification at its simplest. Uh, one of the patterns that we uh, worked out uh, is a relatively simple classification engine, but it's the beginnings of what could become an extremely powerful concept to be able to allow you to take a given machine, identify that machine when it boots up, and then do something uh, on the fly with that machine. So the example could be add profiles to the machine. It could be drive the machine through different workflows uh, and dynamically uh, react to your machine infrastructure as it's brought up. Now this is uh, in complement to or possibly in place of other mechanisms that we can use in digital rebar provision, which is making calls out to external infrastructure. So an example uh, might be calling out to Netbox and getting the information about a machine from Netbox and asking the question of what should this machine do uh, when it comes up. So the classification engine can be tied into that uh, or it can be replaced by that or it can be complementary to that. So there's a couple of ways that those things might interact with each other. So the, the Netbox example is Netbox may not know exactly what that machine is supposed to do, but it may be able to make a decision based on the inventory of that machine. So how much CPU memory disk that machine has might define a SKU configuration for it. So for example, the machine might become a database server or uh, an object server for um, a Swift cluster or something to that effect because of its given configuration in an environment. And so um, the classification side of that has a number of different pieces to it. This, com this content we're going to show you is a relatively simple, easy to view and operate and, and hopefully understand. Uh, and it has uh, 
one piece to it, it's classified content, is the content pack. And if we go to uh, content packages, uh, I've added the classified content through the standard mechanisms uh, of adding uh, browse for more content. If it's not in your list, add it into your list and then transfer. Um, I also have a set of content I wrote that was classified tests, which just has some various uh, profiles and stages for testing uh, all of the different content pieces and driving content through different uh, workflows based on reacting to given machines. Now, I haven't operated this for a little bit, so it's going to be a little rough, and I'm going to refer a little bit more to the capabilities and uh, beef up the documentation so the next time I, I go to demo this or use this, it'll be a little easier. Uh, but essentially, what classify, uh, the classify content does is we can define uh, the actual data, the classification data that we are going to use to drive the machine through the classifier itself. And so it's a relatively um, uh, more advanced looking piece of uh, schema that we verify and validate. Ah, so I'm being reminded that I'm not actually sharing here. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm going to share screen. Let's uh, close that and make things bigger. All right, so thank you, Chris. Appreciate the uh, heads up there. Um, <laughs> so uh, going back, uh, content packages, uh, add content through the standard mechanisms. We have the classify and my classify test content. Uh, if we take a look at the classify content, uh, the actual parameter called classify classification data defines the data structure or the type structure for the content. And I'll go over that in just a little bit. Uh, there's also the ability to provide an override. So if you put 100 machines into the classifier and they're gonna do something automatically, but if you need to pull a couple machines out of that pool that you're testing, you can quickly disable the classifier without turning it off on all of the machines by just adding the parameter disable classifier to true uh, on that specific machine or machines, it'll turn it off. Uh, we have a classify stage that drives the task, which drives the template, which is where the real work gets done. Now, this is not very pretty to look at because it's JSONified. So if we go to the templates and we take a look at the uh, classify shell template, um, let me bring it up in... It'll be a little easier to view, I think, in uh, not workflow silly, templates, class by shell templates. So essentially what we do, um, our standard sort of setup stuff here, here's the disabler, so that disables it. Uh, and then essentially what we have is a set of functions that we can drive a machine through. So we can set a parameter on a machine, uh, we can add a profile on a machine. Uh, we can change the workflow on a machine. So each of these functions just drives a given machine through its uh, subset of what it does. Um, that's the action that gets defined on what to do. Uh, there is the first step of actually uh, classifying the machine. So currently, the classifier itself has uh, only a couple of helpers um, uh, for classification, so it can ask uh, is the machine in a given subnet? We'll determine if the machine is in a given subnet that's passed into us. And then if so, we'll trigger the actions. Uh, if the machine has a given MAC address, then we will do the same thing. So for a given MAC address, we'll fire a given set of actions. Uh, these are just the helpers for getting MAC address. Uh, but then essentially what we do at that point is now we're going templating across the actual classification data. So we take a look at the classification data and we break it down and pull all of that stuff out. We determine uh, the actual action and the uh, classification, which is the, the thing we're going to drive the machine through, if it matches with the uh, 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 matcher set. So let's take a look at, a, I think, uh, classify, here we go. Uh, let's go to content, classify tests. So if we take a look at profiles, uh, classified test profile. So this is my uh, 
content that drives the, the, the testing. So ultimately, this is all boilerplate. We can ignore this for the most part. Um, and ultimately, we define the parameter, classify classification data, and here we say we show what's going to happen. So for the test, has MAC, so if it has this MAC address, uh, 08 uh, Bravo Echo, and if we take a look at my machine here, uh, it's a little hard to see, but Link Ether 08 Bravo Echo is the machine. It's going to do the actions of add the profile, uh, classify test profile red, and change the workflow to classify test workflow red. If otherwise, if it falls through and it doesn't match the previous uh, classification pieces, will fall through to the always uh, stage, which is um, there's a question from Chris. I'll grab that. I'll get to that in just a minute, Chris. Uh, and then it'll fall. This is basically a default. So in this case, the default is just set set it back to sledgehammer weight. So for these tests, I'm just starting in sledgehammer and I'm saying return back to sledgehammer weight, which means do nothing. Um, so Chris has a question was, uh, yes, so has Mac is one of the functions, exactly. So the actions uh, you see here uh, relate, uh, change workflow, add profile, uh, and for the test case, has Mac is indeed one of the uh, functions. So if we go back to uh, the content to classify templates, classify shell template. We see that here in that um, uh, in subnet was one of the, the action tests, and then the other was HazMac. So HazMac, um, the classifier uh, JSON blob that is used uh, assumes that it's going to match a function in the script. So uh, you can add and extend uh, tests. So you can say uh, test um, machine has 256 gig memory or something to that effect. Machine has 24 disks. Uh, all of those things could be um, act, uh, matchers that you can use for the classifier. And then you would have an appropriate uh, action that happens, uh, which would probably be a workflow that drives a machine through a given workflow based on that action. Uh, you can extend these. Um, uh, actions to do any number of things, whatever your uh, brain comes up with is interesting and useful in your environment to extend that capability. Uh, yes, and so Chris's comment was it can be used to enforce uh, practices as machines come up. Uh, yes, and it also allows you to have truly zero touch uh, provisioning. Um, and so ultimately what you would presumably do is uh, in the case of uh, your default profile, if you have infrastructure that you want to dynamically react to your machines and do things automatically for you, I got to find the right machine here. Um, ah, well, here we go. So if you um, have a, a workflow, of, um, for example, that does uh, discover uh, OS install and then some other stages. So you might uh, want to drive a machine through a given set of stages. Uh, our current pattern is sort of the, the ready weight infrastructure. So we generally espouse the concept of boot a bunch of machines, boot them into sledgehammer, stop and wait, and let an operator decide what to do next. The operator then will usually take the machines and drive them through a given set of workflows based on some information. This is where the classifier steps in and can say, okay, I have these sets of machines and this set of data to classify the machines. I want to drive these machines through these given workflows. And it will uh, allow you to complete that step so you can say boot the machine. And at the end of the day, I want it to be a Kubernetes cluster because it's in a given subnet or something to that effect. So that, that is how the classifier sort of glues into things. Ultimately, you would simply drop in the classify uh, stage into a workflow that you're gonna drive a machine uh, through. So the classify stage uh, requires the classification data, and then it will run the task classify, which runs the um, shell template uh, that we were reviewing earlier. Uh, so ultimately, you can construct a single uh, workflow that you might 
possibly set as your default workflow for system wide. So a machine boots up. If you know about these machines and know how to classify these machines, do these actions. If you don't fall through to the default, which is just go to sledgehammer wait. So that, that might be where uh, one of the use cases comes in to play there. So essentially, if we take a look at this machine, we had the uh, 08 colon BE MAC address on uh, Pixie client two, uh, which is this machine here. And so we've, um, I'm gonna reset this back to uh, sledgehammer weights, restart the runner. Uh, my poor Mac is groaning under the strain. Um, but essentially we now have this machine that has classified test profile. If we take a look at what that uh, classified test profile looks like, uh, we saw that in the uh, profile here. So classified test profile. This is the classified classification data. So it says if it has a uh, Mac address uh, of this, we're gonna do the add the profile and change the workflow. Otherwise, just leave it in sledgehammer wait. So that's, that's what we're ultimately gonna drive that through. So if we take and drive this through classify, we should see that we actually have that on the console uh, output as part of the task that the machine was classified as task red. Now we see that automatically the profile, classified test profile red was added and it was switched into the classified test workflow red. Uh, which is what output the console statement. And now that has finished. So we just selected that machine uh, and drove it through. So now if we take a machine that we don't have a MAC address in, so in this case, we don't have this machine's MAC address listed for a test. So it should fail and fall through to the always, which is set uh, classified test sledgehammer weight. It's just a clone of sledgehammer weight, but I renamed it so it we can visually see that it changes. So if we drive that machine uh, through, dang it, drive it through, we should see that the classification engine just drops it into classified test sledgehammer weight. So it did nothing, uh, and sorry, the console went blank, but it didn't output a console message here. So um, that machine did nothing because it didn't match the classification steps. And then if we wanted to actually just see that, we drive multiple machines through the same set of engine stuff and it goes ahead and reclassifies it. As we see, we got the output on the console. And again, our, our blue machine essentially, our blue red machine is uh, just filed through the default classification engine. So that's kind of it. Um, uh, I, I, I remembered how to drive this. <laughs> on the fly. So this is just a, a real simple um, test content pack that drives a classify engine uh, using the uh, classify um, classification data profile here that we were looking at previously that drove it through that classify that shell that uh, template. All right, uh, that's sort of it in a wrap. Uh, any questions, uh, Chris? Um, DSL stuff comes out of this? Yes, uh, exactly. Um, no other questions. Victor, did you have anything else you wanted to add in there? Nope, Chris's I haven't actually up. used the classify stuff myself, so I can't really talk too much about it. So. All righty then. Well, there you go. We got to educate Victor on classify. Was it useful for you? Did it make sense? Was I just talking gobbledygook? Uh, it's useful for me. It kind of reminds me of something that I did, uh, or a subsystem that I wrote for the uh, older digital rebar. DRV2, yeah. 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 I think a lot of this um, pattern came uh, from uh, Greg put this pattern together originally uh, for one of our customer engagements, and it probably came from similar concepts of DRV2 capability. So, okay, excellent. That's. Uh, uh, Digital Rebar Meetup version 23 wrapped up. If there are no further questions from uh, community, then we will wrap it up and call it a day. Thank you very much, everyone.